Has the Lord been good to anybody this week? Well, it's good to see you after this Thanksgiving week. Good to see uh, most of our men back in the in here. They didn't shoot nobody or shoot. They didn't shoot nobody or they didn't get shot. So they're back safely. But uh, it's good to see you all this morning. How many enjoyed their Thanksgiving with family? Everybody turkeyed and hammed out. Ready for Christmas turkey and ham now, right? Amen. Well, it's good to see you. It's good to be here. Just uh, one announcement, and I'm going to get out of the way. But don't forget, out front, there are two big plastic um, buckets uh, with the reverse advent. There's a list of things that we are collecting, and people have asked where these things are going. Uh, you want to kind of give uh, a little... Well, there's a variety of places that they're going to be going. 
the main thing is they're going to people in need. Um, I think that we're going to make up some bags for um, maybe homeless shelters to give out to people for the home, that would be beneficial to them. Um, there's a couple things that would be good for babies, and I know that we have the Gabriel Project in Charleston, so we'll be donating some things to there. And then um, possibly some little um, uh, boxes um, to give out to people for food, like for Christmas to help with their Christmas dinner. Amen. So out there are the buckets. So if you want to start bringing stuff in, I'm excited for that. Don't forget service tonight at 630. We got a special, special, special treat tonight. This guy back here on the bass guitar for the first time is going to take the pulpit. You can't see him right now. He's all masked up, but that's Nate. But Nate's going to take the pulpit tonight for the very first time, and I'm excited, and we need to come out and support him. Amen? So 6.30 tonight, Brother Nate's going to be preaching. This praise team's going to be leading us in worship. But if you have your offering, if our ushers would come, we're going to go to the Lord in our giving, and I'm going to get out of the way and turn this praise team loose. If you have that offering, if you would raise it to the Lord. God. We thank you for the Fountain of Life Worship Center. We thank you that we are a growing church. We thank you that we are a united church. We thank you that we are a fruitful church. We thank you that this is a place you are blessing. As we give our tithe and offering, we are believing you for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money money, debts destroyed. We are thankful that we have this opportunity to give. We ask for your peace and joy to invade our circumstances. We speak divine protection and good health over us. We ask for provision spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. We speak victory over our church, ourselves, our family, and our community. And we say amen, amen, amen. As we go into worship and, and prayer, I want you all to still remember Michael Kirk. Michael, they didn't admit him into the hospital, but he is home. He was having some trouble breathing. But Michael, uh, everyone else around him has tested negative. So him and his brother are the only two positive. So remember them. And and also remember uh, Brandy Reese and Lacey, they've tested positive, so they need our prayers too. So, And it's good to see Lonnie Berry back here healthy and COVID free. Amen. So God bless you as you give. We love you. Let's worship.
Playmaker, playmaker, 
close our eyes just for a moment and I want you just to kind of recap your life and look at the times he has been your way maker <laughs> some of you it's been marital issues some it's been financial some it's been healings but has he been good to anybody this morning? Has he been anybody's way maker over the years? Can we just lift our hands and thank him? How many times? I love that bridge. I want them to get ready to do it again. But how many times, even when we didn't know it, he was working. We couldn't see it. We couldn't feel it. <laughs> but he was on the <laughs> he was behind the scenes working all things out for our good Darkness, my God, that 
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. this praise team not do an awesome job amen this week at the mill creek church of god brother rob moxley's going to be preaching up there if anybody wants to go but this praise team's going to be singing on thursday evening correct or george moxley i said i only know who rob moxley is but george moxley but george moxley will be at mill creek this week starting he's there this morning and be there tonight and then all week I think Wednesday night is the only, he won't be there Wednesday, right? The praise team will be there Thursday. That'll be a good night to go. We're going to pray. And after we pray, our kids that are still left in here, they can be dismissed with David to go back in the fellowship hall for kids' church. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, we're just thankful again for this day. We're thankful that You've given us this opportunity to come into your house and, and freely worship. God, I thank you for this praise team who has set the table for us to receive your word this morning. And God, I ask this morning that your word do exactly what you sent it to do. To change us, to, to rebuke us, to correct us. God, I, I'm so thankful that, God, if we truly get into your word, God, it finds those bad places in our life and corrects God and I think so many times we get frustrated because we don't want to be corrected but God I ask your word to do that let us not be hearers only but do, be doers of your word we thank you this morning we praise you in Jesus name amen 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 we've talked about godly virtues over the last several weeks and today I pray you all enjoyed a great Thanksgiving week and weekend, but we're going to close out this series on godly virtues, and next week we'll be going into the, the Christmas season, but we've talked the first week, we talked about honor, and then the second week we talked about the topic of being loyal. Last week we looked at integrity, and what I want to talk to you about today is a virtue that is almost totally forgotten in the world that we are growing up in today. This generation that is living today has been labeled as the entitlement generation or the entitled generation. They feel like they don't have to work, that everybody owes them, and matter of fact, we deserve it. And now before those of us who are older say anything about this younger generation, we have to realize something. We've created by our actions and our attitude a generation that feels entitled. What are you saying, Pastor? 
How did we do that? We did that in a lot of different ways. I would say for those of you that are 50 and older, I'm going to get on the younger and the older. It was typical of you that are 50 and older, it was very typical of a person to work way too much. And what we ended up with, we ended up with families that were fragmented, that never got to see family. Dad was always at work making money, and what ended up happening was we had a lot of families in divorce. And then what happened was, well, we love our kids, so we tried to make up the lack of time by giving them everything they wanted. Never saying no. I'm a dad. I'm in this category. Here, you can have this, or here, you can have that. I'll just make more money, and I'll give you more. I may not be able to give you time, but I can give you stuff. Whatever you feel like you're entitled to, I'll give you. So this younger generation just felt like, hey, if I want it, baby, I'll just ask mommy and daddy and they'll give it to me. And not only have we give, 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 but we've raised a generation of pansies. Oh boy. We have raised a generation of pansies. When I was a kid, you could ride in the back of a pickup truck with 18 other of your friends. I can remember my mom had a 1978 Grand Prix. It seated 700. I can remember we would have so many people in that car. Remember when the speakers were in the back, in the window? I would be the one in the window with my head down in the speaker listening to the McCamies or the Hemfields or somebody on 8-track. Anybody remember all that? Nowadays, we're buckled down with 43 different seat belts. Totally protected. You can't even ride a bicycle on the street without getting a citation for having a helmet on. I'd have never made it. Because, baby, we're going to protect this generation. It goes on. When I was a kid, I drank from a water hose. I think I turned out fine. <laughs> it's debatable with some of you. <laughs> when I was a kid, you used to actually have to win something to get a trophy. How many remember that? You had to win something to get something. Now you just show up. Now, pastor, everybody deserves a trophy. I disagree. Strongly disagree because losing in life makes us better people. Losing in life makes people strive for better things. We become better people when we lose. I'm not a winner all the time. I knew that if I wanted to make the team and if I wanted to win, I had to work hard and I had to get better. Not just, well, just come on, join us. We'll pat you on the back. And it used to drive me nuts. His basketball team, for years, we were horrible. Horrible. He's even shaking his head. Like, we would cheer if we scored four points. Like, it was awesome. Like, we're getting hammered. By 30, but hey, we scored four. We were a third grade team and beat a bunch of second graders one time at the buzzer and thought we did something. And I'll never forget, we were in the gym one day and they handed him a medal. 
And I said, he didn't do nothing. We lost. And Talena was like, let that kid have a medal. And I was like, no, we don't want it. We lost. Like last place, not even second place. I don't want a medal for getting last place. Now it's like, hey, I know you were last, but you ran so slowly, and we're just so proud of you. So here's a trophy. Congratulations on being last. And it's built a generation of people who feel entitled. I showed up, so give me. It's not just them, it's me. Culture has created a sense of, you owe me. I'm here. We see it in our churches. We see it on the job. We see it in our politics. We're just not grateful people anymore. Gratitude is a virtue that has just about become extinct. There's a remarkably interesting story in the Bible about some people who looked entitled. Matter of fact, there's ten of them, and Jesus does something remarkable for them, and only one of them comes back to give thanks to him. Let's look at this story in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus Master, have mercy on us. You can be seated. Now, let me just pause for a moment and give you some context so you will understand. A leper had one of the most painful diseases that you could ever imagine. See, people just think it was spots on people. No, this sickness actually affects the nerve endings. And it was very, very painful. This physical pain was so bad that according to Leviticus chapter 13, whenever someone got close to a person with leprosy, the person with leprosy would have to scream out themselves and go around and say, unclean, unclean. Warning the people that was coming close to them to either go the other way or I'm coming through, wait a minute. But either way, it had to be very humiliating to walk down the street and see people that you used to hang out with and see them coming and they would not even be able to stop and talk to you. In fact, you had to look at them, Katie, and say, unclean, unclean. Not only were they physically hurting all the time, but they had to have emotional pain because they had, to, had no relationships in years. So then these ten guys, they see across the street, hey, is that not the man that is rumored to heal people? So you can only imagine the excitement as they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, help us, please. I mean, this could be the greatest moment of my life. If he could hear me, he can heal me. Then this could be the miracle upon miracles. So they begin to cry out. And look at verse 14. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Miracle. Healed. Their disease is gone. Their greatest dream has come. I mean, they're healed. Their prayer has just been answered. And then verse 15 says something very surprising to me. How many of them does verse 15 talk about? Now, one of them. One. When he saw he had been healed 
turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. One out of ten. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? You were begging. You were crying out. You were in distress. Your life was basically nothing you were going to survive out your days all alone. You cried out, God sent me. Where did you go? What are you doing? And you've got to admit, the nine, they probably were not bad people. They're just thinking, I want to go home. I want to go tell my wife I'm healed. I want to go see my kids. I want to see my family. I mean... I didn't ask for leprosy. I didn't deserve it. I had this healing coming to me. This is what happened. And these nine slipped into the entitlement mindset. Only one happy stopped and thanked God for healing them. Only one stopped and said, thank you, God, for your blessings. And my question is, will you be the one? Will you be the one? Because truthfully, the odds are stacked against us. Will you be the one who daily says, I'm going to pause and give glory and honor to the one that gave me life? Am I going to be the one that will stop in all the busyness of Christmas and lift up worship to my creator and my sustainer? Am I going to be the one in all the busyness that's going to stop and give praise and honor and worship and glory to the one? Will we be the one? And not just with God, but what about other people that impact your life? Will you be the one that stops and Writes a thank you note to express your gratitude to somebody that's impacted your life. Will you be the one today who's right now being your children and your teenagers are being ministered to by people? Will you be the one today that goes and says, Jacob, thank you in, for investing in my kids. Shelly, thank you for investing in my kids. David, Tasha, Kimmy, thank you for investing in my kids. Belinda, Brenda, thank you for investing in my kids. Misty, Vicki, Stephanie, thank you for investing in our children. Will we be the one that truly goes and says with gratitude in our heart, thank you. Will you be the one that just stops and says, do you, do you know this message has wreaked havoc on me all week long. Friday night in my office, I came in and I stayed here late Friday evening and I was in my office and, and at about 3.30, I had to call a little league baseball coach from Logan. He, God put him on my mind so strong. And I was like, what in the world? And at 3.30, I called him. And he was so excited to hear from me. I hadn't talked to him in years. And we sat and talked on the phone for an hour. And when we hung up, I said, really, my own, the reason I called was, I just wanted to call and thank you for coaching. Pastor, that was 30 some years ago. He still needs thanked. When's the last time we thanked your teacher, or thanked somebody who leads your small group, or th just thank your mom and dad? Man, they need a big applause and a thank you. <laughs> they need a trophy. They do, they deserve the trophy. 
We'll be, I mean, can we be the one that just stops to show honor and gratitude? Or will we be like most people? Well, I had it coming. I don't have time to stop and say thank you. Matter of fact, I give and tithe to this church. I mean, they should be doing this for my children. You, you're like, you're cringing, but a lot of people have that mindset. We'll continue to live with ungrateful mindsets. You may say, well, I'm, I'm not ungrateful, Pastor. I'm generally a grateful person. That's what I like to think also. But as I've examined my life this week, in the last few weeks, I've realized that I have some incredible ingratitude. I'm so often ungrateful in so many different ways. I take my wife for granted for the things she does. I take Belinda for granted for the things she does around here. We all do. I don't think anybody knows what she does. Come and stay in this, just sit in this church for a couple days, hid in your office, and you'll see what she does. She does a lot that we don't, that we don't even pay her to do. She just does it because she loves her church and she loves working for the Lord and she just does it. I take workers at the church for granted because they should do it. This is their church. I apologize for being ungrateful. Another interesting story in the New Testament. Jesus told this story about a guy who had two sons, younger and one older. And it's amazing because you can see ungrateful mindsets in both kids' lives. And I just want to look at this story and give you two things. The first ungrateful mindset is I want it now. Look with me to Luke chapter 15. You see this attitude that I want it now in the attitude of a younger son of a person that we call the prodigal. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and 12. And Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. I want it now. Traditionally, you receive your inheritance after someone dies. I want it now. I want to go live my life, Dad. I want to go. I don't like your rules. I want my rules. I don't want to have to wait. I want what you have, and I want it now. So the father, for whatever reason, gives it to his son. You read that story, and he squanders it. He wastes it. He blows it. He hires women. He throws big parties, and he's lived it up wild. What took the father years to save, this ungrateful son has totally wasted in a matter of weeks because I want it now. What's interesting is the upcoming generation really has this I want it now mindset. You see people in their 20s who really feel like they deserve to live at the same standards that their parents are living at now. Do you realize that most of your parents are 50s and 60s and 70 years old? They had to work to get to where they're at. Well, I need the same kind of home that my mom has, or I want the same kind of home. I want to drive the same kind of car. I want to take the same kind of vacations. I'm 23, I'm 25, I'm 28, and I want to live at the same standards or better than my parents are now. Where do they learn that from? They learned it from parents. If I want it, I'm going to get it now. I had a cousin who wore a shirt all the time in high school that says, my dad's name is Visa. It's the truth. 
Whatever happened to the old school thought of if you wanted it, you save up your money before you buy it? Some of you are like, what? Why save when you can just charge it? Why? Because if you will save, you won't be paying 29% interest the rest of your life. Used to be people would actually save their money and they would do something that we call wait. What does wait mean? Wait means you don't get it now. I know it's totally insane. Because we've been trained, we have been conditioned. And what happened is one generation conditioned the next one that if you want it, you deserve it. Now, and if you don't have it, maybe somebody owes you, and they just ain't giving it to you. Something's wrong. I want it. Adam, give it to me now. The other mindset is, I deserve more. The younger brother goes off and blows all the inheritance. Then one day he wakes up and he goes, man, I'm stupid. This is bad. Now I don't have anything. Even the servants at my dad's house are better off than I am right now. I'm going to go back and do this thing called beg. So when he comes back, we know the story. The father, who is a picture of our heavenly father, is waiting on the very edge of the town. And he's going, thank God my son is back. He throws a party. Gives him a robe and a ring and kills the fatted calf. Now he's throwing this big party. And the big brother, though, he's having a pity party. He's outside going, wait a minute. I never broke the rules. Wait a minute. Nobody did that for me. I've been here all this time and nobody's killed the fatted calf and done any of this stuff for me. I deserve that and more because I'm better than him. Look at verse 29. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. Someone owes me. I deserve better than this, Dad. I deserve more. I didn't do what he did. And here is what we so often see. I deserve a better paying job. Now tell me if this does not sound like our society. I deserve a better paying job. And if I can't get a better paying job, I just won't have a job. The dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I've known people that's laid off says I can't work for $11 an hour. And I'm like, it's better than zero. I got to have more than that. Well, 11 is more than zero. I'd rather do nothing until I get the job that I deserve. I deserve all those benefits. I've worked all my life. I deserve a vacation. I don't need to start at the bottom again. It's crazy that we live in a society that we've got 10-year-olds who feel like they have been punished because we don't give them a smartphone. Ten-year-olds. I deserve more. And just to be really honest, whatever happened to part-time jobs for 16-year-olds to pay for their vehicles? Now, 16-year-olds get mad if they don't get a brand new car at 16. I got a Bondo buggy. If you don't know what that means, it means really no metal, all Bondo. I had a Bondo, but the whole bed, people would go to set, get up in the back of my truck and I'd say, I probably would not do that. 
I had a 1988 S10. When you went to open the, the glove box, it didn't fall down. It came out. <laughs> Where did they learn that? From another generation that said, I deserve this kind of vacation. Even if I can't have it, I'll charge it. I deserve this kind of house. I'm worth it. What does God say to us about an ungrateful, ungrateful hearts? Let's be real, and, let's, and I want to be as biblically correct as I possibly can, but let's ask God to expose any material, any financial ungratefulness in our life because, listen to me, this is where we are in life right now. I am dissatisfied with my 65-inch flat-screen TV because I can't be happy unless it's 75-inch. Oh, every one of us, our toes are curled. I'm dissatisfied because I only have 30 pair of shoes in my closet and I deserve 40. Then I'm only going to wear 20. I only have 15 coach purses. I need 20 or the 16th one. I have every tool, Joe, I'm going to get on you right here. Every tool, every gun in the world, but I need one more. I go to a closet full of clothes and I scream, I have nothing to wear, Talena. No, me and Trina went to a place. We saw what it was like for kids to really say, I don't have clothes. And yet I'm in my closet full of stuff and I'm going, I have nothing to wear because I don't like what's in there. I don't like my car. I've heard people say, my car's three years old, I need a new one. I'm like, what? I don't buy them until they're three years old. Well, pastor, I don't have heated seats, and I can't plug my gadgets in, and I really need to go in debt so I can plug in an eye gadget. Think about it. Our mindset is, I really wish I had more money. I really wish I had a better job. I really wish I could provide more for my kids. I really wish that, that we could have a better car. I really wish I could take better vacations. Materially and financially, we're ungrateful. Call it what it is. Own it. Well, you know what? My husband, I wish he were whatever. I wish he had a better job. I wish he had more money. I wish he was a better spiritual leader. I wish he could fix things around the house. He's just not. My wife, I wish she were just more fun. I wish she were just more whatever. I wish she'd make more food around the house. I wish she had a better paying job. I wish she had a job. <laughs> whatever it is, she's just not, or he's just not. Well, I'm not happy because I don't have a girlfriend. Well, I'm not happy because I don't have a boyfriend. I wish my boyfriend, I mean, you know, I just wish this. I wish my boyfriend had a job. If your boyfriend don't have a job and he's like, you might want to start thinking about a new boyfriend. It goes on and on and on and on. My friends aren't what they're supposed to be. And, you know, we're, and relationally, we're ungrateful. Another problem we have is circumstantial ungratefulness. Well, I don't really like my job. I don't really like my house. I don't really like my hair or lack thereof. Man, I just don't get the brakes happy. Call it what it is, Adam. It's ungratefulness. It's ungratefulness. What we need to do is have an attitude of gratefulness. How do we get there? What do we do? How do we go from being entitled to grateful? How do we cultivate an attitude of gratitude? 
we have to decide to turn our blessings into a praise. We have to make a conscious decision that every blessing that God gives us, we're going to turn it back into praise. There's a verse from a song that our praise team sings every now and then. It says, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. I would sing it for you, but you would not praise God if I did. But every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Every blessing I don't turn back to praise turns into pride. Every blessing that I don't turn back to praise turns into pride because, Adam, I deserve this. Misty, I had this coming to me. I'm worthy of this. Now I deserve more and I want more. It's pride. It's entitlement. Every blessing, every good thing, God, you are the giver of all good gifts. I'm not saying money is bad. I want you to have money. I want money. Everybody wants money, but we can't let money have us. Paul said it this way, and I love this, Philippians chapter 4. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He says that whatever the circumstance, you know, If I'm healthy, if I'm not. If I've got a lot of money, if I don't have any. If I like my job, if I don't like my job. If I have a lot of hair or if I don't have a lot of hair. I have learned. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it means to have plenty. And he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. This is something you learn. This is a mindset. This is, you train your mind, your heart, your attitude, your, your, your spirit. What's the secret? The secret is, is I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. This is learned. Because I'm going to tell you, by nature, most of us are not grateful. By nature, we're not. By nature, we're sinners. By nature, I am not a content person. I want more. And some people say, well, you're a pastor. No, I'm a person. By nature, a lot of times, I am dissatisfied. By nature, I am a complainer. I have to train my mind. I have learned the secret of being content, Paul said. Selena, if you'll come to the piano. I love what Scripture says. Ecclesiastes 6, 9 says, Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. Better what God has put before you than roving and hoping for something more. Better the blessings that God has put right here than longing for what I wish I had. I think we miss it so many times. I think, Dimpy, the greatest blessings that God gives us is right in our laps. And we're too busy wanting something else. And we don't turn our blessing back into praise. Better for what the eyes sees than a roving of the appetite here's what the bible says the bible says in proverbs 15 the cheerful heart has a continual feast better a little with the fear of the lord than great wealth with turmoil the next time you say i'm sick of my car 
Why don't we look at it with a different perspective and say, God, I thank you that I have a car. That I'm in the top three to five percent of the most wealthiest people in the world. If you've got a car, if you have an, a, a, an automobile, you are in the top three to five percent of the wealthiest people in the world. My house is always a mess. How about God, I thank you that I'm blessed with family and friends who mess up my house. Or my house is too small. God, I thank you that I have a toilet, an air conditioner, and a heater. I got running water. God, I'm thankful for the blessings that you've given me. Well, I don't really like my job and I don't like the people I work with. God, I'm thankful in a world where so many people are looking and searching for employment, you've placed me in a job. God, I thank you that today I'm healthy and I'm thankful that you have given me this day. God, I thank you for my friends. God, I thank you, not just for material stuff, but God, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for me. Thank you that you took a person who deserved death and hell and eternal damnation. Thank you, God. Because you did something for me that I never, ever, ever deserved. How about God thank you for forgiving and transforming this old boy right here. Thank you, God, for all the blessings that you have sent to the Fry household. Can we bow our heads? God, right now, we repent of our ungratefulness. God, for our feeling of entitlement. God, I pray that you help us never complain when you have blessed us beyond measure. More than we can ever imagine. God, I pray that you would allow us to see those that are truly without so that we can see how much we have. Not only can we see how much we have, but God, that we can be grateful for what we have. I want you just for a moment with your eyes closed. I just want you to be honest. If you see any ingratitude in your heart, any ungratefulness that you just say this morning, God, I want your forgiveness for my spirit of entitlement. God, I confess this morning to you, God, would you forgive me of ungratefulness? God, I thank you that Pastor Mick preached this series and that you're planting these godly virtues that are so important back into the church. God, we confess that we can be so ungrateful. God, give us eyes to see the blessings of relationships. The blessings of being in a church that's reaching people. The blessings of relationships, the blessings of your presence, the, the power of your Holy Spirit. God, forgive us for complaining when we have so much and believe the lie that we have so little. God, change the fountain of life to people 
who are overflowing with an attitude of gratitude and that worship you. I've asked Helena to sing a song she wrote. And here in just a second, she's going to sing this song. And when she does, I want us just to stand to our feet and raise our hands with the spirit of thanksgiving. But before she does, how many today are here and you'd say, you know what? Pastor Mick, I'm not even walking with the Lord. I don't even know him. And today, I want to be forgiven. Today, I want to be saved. I want to give my life today to Jesus. And when you do, your sins will be forgiven. You'll be transformed. And that's why you're here today. If that's your prayer, would you raise your hand right now? Would you raise your hand in this place right now and say, Pastor, I'm here today. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to give my life to Christ. Would anyone? Today is the day of salvation. Pastor, I'm ready to commit myself to Christ. Anybody? Anyone? 